Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. My name is Jeremy Lightman. If you haven't seen me or met me before, and uh, I'm standing in for Pastor Zarling this week, and then next week you'll have the other campus pastor at Shoreland uh, Lutheran High School, Pastor Bauer, will be here. Uh, Today is the theme of today's worship is uh, through the word the Lord delivers forgiveness. You can find a nice little summary of that uh, on page on the top of page two in your service folder and we'll follow the order of service called setting two in your hymnal. Uh, We'll begin with hymn number 652, hymn 652. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God. Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, 
and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord.
Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading comes from the prophet Daniel, chapter 9, beginning with verse 15. This is a prayer that Daniel is speaking to God. And now, Lord our God, you who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made a name for yourself to this very day, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Lord, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, although because of our sins and the guilt of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are viewed with contempt by everyone around us. Now listen, our God, to the prayer of your servant and to his plea for grace, and let your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary for your sake, my Lord. My God, turn your ear toward us and listen. Open your eyes and see the desolation that is upon us and the city that is called by your name. No, it is not because of our righteous acts that we are casting our plea for grace before you, but because of your great acts of compassion. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, pay attention. Act and do not delay. For your sake, my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We'll join now in singing Psalm 40, found in the front part of your hymnal, Psalm 40.
Our second reading comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor males who have sex with males, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor the verbally abusive, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were those types of people. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are permitted for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permitted for me, but I will not allow anything to control me. Foods are for the belly, and the belly is for foods, but God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then remove the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For it says the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. The word of the Lord. record of Jesus' life, please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 7. A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Just then, a sinful woman from that town learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him near his feet, weeping, and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she began to wipe them with her hair, while also kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner." Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say it. A certain moneylender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Then he told him, You have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. Yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, that is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. Those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? 
he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, and any children here today are welcome to come forward for the children's devotion. Do you want to move this way? I'm going to sit here. she had to wash the dirt out of her hair later. But she was so thankful that Jesus forgave her sins that she said, I, I don't care if it makes my hair dirty. I want to do this nice thing for Jesus. And that's how we thank God today, not by washing people's feet with our hair, but by doing other things. When, when you're polite or you show good manners, when you uh, give somebody a gift or even just giving somebody a hug, uh, and letting them know that you love them, that is a way that you can say, thank you, God, for forgiving all my sins. I want to show my thankfulness by doing something nice for somebody else. So uh, why don't we say a prayer about that? Dear Lord Jesus, there are lots of ways that we can show our thankfulness to you. Thank you for accepting all of our praise and appreciation. Thank you most of all for forgiving our sins and dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Help us to remember that and bless us as we continue to hear your words throughout this service and for the rest of our lives. In your name we pray, amen. We'll sing our next hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll consider today's gospel from Luke chapter 7. Dear fellow redeemed people often say that no one shows good manners anymore. You can't find common courtesy these days. And usually with a comment like that, the sentiment is that years ago, people were better at practicing manners than they are in our modern time. Well, that's simply not the case. And you can tell that by looking at God's Old Testament law. He had several commands in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that dealt specifically with showing good manners. Let me read a couple of them for you. In Leviticus 19, it says, You shall not curse a deaf person, nor shall you put an obstacle in front of a blind person, but you must fear your God. I am the Lord. Well, from a purely human perspective, you might ask, why would anybody care about insulting a deaf person, especially if they don't have any family around to tell them what the insult was? They can't hear it. Well, it has to do with good manners. The way that you treat someone, even if they don't know that you're treating them well, reflects your attitude toward God. Later on in that same chapter, it says, You must rise in the presence of gray hair and show respect in the presence of an elder so that you fear your God. I am the Lord. Just because someone is older than you does not mean that you have to obey them or do whatever they tell you. So why does God care so much about honoring people with more life experience than you. Again, it's good manners. It says something about your beliefs toward God whom you cannot see. This is really a large part of the point Jesus made in the house of Simon the Pharisee. I'd invite you to open up your service folders if you have them closed and take another look at Luke chapter 7 with me. It would go too far to say that politeness is the main point of this text. But you certainly see a lot of manners and customs all throughout it. And you even see good manners on the part of someone like Simon the Pharisee. Right away in the first verse, it says, A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. That was nice of Simon to invite Jesus over for a meal. Now, they wouldn't have eaten their meals like we do today by sitting on chairs at a table. They had tables much lower to the ground, and instead of a chair, every person eating got a mat, and you would prop your head up toward the table on one end of the mat with your feet extended away from the table. That helps you to understand how it was that this woman could stand behind Jesus during the meal and at the same time wipe his feet while everyone was eating. But even before that, you can see good manners. Like I said, Simon invited Jesus over. So even if he was trying to trick Jesus or catch him off guard with his words, Simon still had to put on a polite face to invite Jesus over to his house. And why did Simon do that? Well, we could guess that, like so often, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus in his words. Or perhaps Simon knew that Jesus was a popular teacher and he wanted to follow popular trends, so he knew he could have a good party if he invited Jesus there. But with both of those guesses, we're really assuming the worst about Simon, aren't we? The only thing we know about his mental process is what the Holy Spirit revealed to us in verse 39. While the woman anointed Jesus, Simon thought, if this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. We wouldn't know that Simon thought that unless God revealed it to us. So let's read those words very carefully. If you keep an open mind about it, you'd have to say, Simon sounds like someone who was at least open to the idea that Jesus was a true prophet. And if you think that I'm being too generous with Simon or too nice with him, 
Well, notice that Jesus himself was pretty nice and polite with Simon, even as he rebuked him. People like to talk about how Jesus would all, always socialize with the prostitutes and the lowlifes of society. Well, this reading gives us a good example of how Jesus affiliated even with the hypocrites and the upper class. He wants to socialize with any of us. And did you catch the part where he called Simon a sinner? It was hard to catch because he did it so indirectly. He spoke a parable and let the people there put together the pieces. Wasn't that nice of him? He didn't dress Simon down in his own home in front of all his guests. And that's how Jesus handles us as well. If you've ever had a, a pastor or a teacher who was speaking God's word to you and you felt like it was very personal, but there was no way that that pastor or teacher could have known your personal matters, well, that's Jesus being gentle and speaking to you in a polite way while still pointing out sin. He said, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon said, say it. So there were two men who owed a banker loans. One owed a lot and the other owed a little. The banker decided to cancel both loans. Simon, tell me, which one do you think liked that banker more? Simon said, I would assume the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. You've been doing a lot of judging up till now, and that was your first correct judgment, Simon. And then look at verses 44 through 46. Simon, uh, Jesus talks all about manners and being polite. All of these things that Simon could have done, chances or opportunities he had to show his gratitude, and yet he didn't take any of those chances. Jesus was basically saying to Simon, Simon, everybody here can tell that you must have very little amounts of sin because you appreciate God's forgiveness so little. On the contrary, Jesus went on, this woman has an awful lot of sin. And you can tell how grateful she is and how much she appreciates God's forgiveness. You'll notice that with both of these, it wasn't Simon showing a little bit of gratitude that got him a little bit of forgiveness. That would be ridiculous. And it would also be silly to think that the woman showing Jesus a lot of gratitude caused God to give her a lot of forgiveness. No, in both cases, the forgiveness came first and the appreciation followed it. But this still may leave some questions in your mind, like why does Jesus talk here about people committing a little bit versus a lot of sin? I thought all sins were the same to God. Isn't this Pharisee just as sinful as the woman washing Jesus' feet? Yes, let's get that straight right away. The very first time that this woman had sex outside of marriage, she offended God and became a child of hell. And the very first time that a feeling of superiority entered Simon the Pharisee's mind, he made himself God's enemy and earned eternal pain for it. Both of these people have the same amount of sin in God's sight. So when Jesus talks about a lot versus a little, he's not talking about in God's courtroom. Jesus could mean one of two things here. On the one hand, he could mean, Simon, you just think you have a little bit of sin, and it's obvious because you're only showing a little bit of appreciation for God's forgiveness. You need to take your sin and God's forgiveness more seriously. But it's also true that there are sins on this earth which do more damage, and there are sins that do less damage. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, lead us not into temptation, and Luther's small catechism explains that as we wanting God to guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our flesh may not deceive us or lead us into great and shameful sin. Great and shameful sin does not mean that 
God is more angry about some and less angry about others. It means that there are sins that do damage to a wider range of victims. For instance, if you lust after a woman on the beach, that's sin. If you carry out and take up an actual affair with her, that's worse. If you hate your supervisor at work, God counts that as equal with murder in his courtroom. But if you actually follow through with the killing, that does more damage to a wider range of victims. And this woman knew that. She knew that the type of sin she committed, although it was just as damning in God's sight as Simon the Pharisee's sins, she knew that hers had done greater damage. She could see it in her life. If she had children, she could see it in their lives. And that also gave her a greater capacity to appreciate God's forgiveness. She shed real tears because she felt real guilt and she appreciated God's real forgiveness. We need to imitate this woman. Not just in the way that she appreciated God's forgiveness so much, but this woman who anointed Jesus' feet clearly knew her Bible really well. She had to know all these passages that predicted the Messiah so well that she could fit them together and see that Jesus lined up with those predictions. A good way that you could do that is by coming to Bible class. It is here at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. The more you get to know God's word personally in your own life, the more like this woman you'll be able to see his will for your life. And we also could imitate this woman by appreciating that Jesus came to solve our problems, but he came to solve our biggest problem of sin. Do you think that after this woman left her life of sin, that suddenly her life was problem-free and she never had any troubles anymore? Jesus came to heal our woes and to take away our diseases, but sometimes he lets those diseases and earthly pains remain. And this woman appreciated that. She most of all thanked God for his forgiveness. So that's why we shouldn't just rush past it in verse 48 when Jesus repeated that word of forgiveness. Jesus had already announced forgiveness in his parable for Simon the Pharisee. He already said, God has forgiven the debts of all sinners, the ones with a big debt and the ones with a little debt. And then he repeated that forgiveness in verse 48. He told the woman directly, your sins have been forgiven. There are a lot of non-denominational and Protestant Christians out there who get offended when they hear Lutherans tell each other that you are forgiven. They say, how can your pastors say that to you? Only God can forgive sins. They kind of forget that's what Simon's other guests were saying in this account. Yes, only God can make the initial decision to wipe away mankind's guilt. And he did that when he decided to send a Savior into the world. But in Matthew 18 and John 20, Jesus has given all of us believers the keys to unlock people's sinfulness from them. You can pronounce forgiveness for anyone and release them from their guilt. And that is the great gift that Christ has given to us and that I now impart to you. Your sins are forgiven. Your guilt is taken away. You are God's child. Amen. Please stand. We'll join in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our offering. Let's join in the prayer of the church. We'll use the responsive prayer of the church on page 182 in the front of your hymnal. Page 182, and you may join in speaking the parts in bold print. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to your world in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Since we already did the offering, we'll continue with the preface on page 183. Please stand.
is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns forever in perfect unity with you and the Holy Spirit, as one God and one Lord. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat. This is Jesus' body given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat. The true body of Christ given into death for you.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our final hymn. Excuse me, just one moment. There's one more announcement I need to get from the room back here. I'll save that for the end so it can keep you guessing and wondering what that's all about. Uh, the design for the new sign at uh, the Caledonia campus is finalized. You can give towards the sign with special envelopes and through Easy Tithe. I guess this is a, a view of it, top view, side view. Looks very nice. Uh, please attend the open forum on June 29th and the voters meeting July 6th as we discuss the parish house. That would uh, must be at the Racine campus. Teens, if you are in 7th grade through 12th grade, you are invited to go canvassing and mini golfing on June 25th. Invite your friends, family, and neighbors to register for our soccer camp August 1st through the 5th 
at the Caledonia campus. Your family is invited to the first annual Water of Life Camp and Cookout at Camp Oak Ridge, August 12th through the 14th. Pastor Zarling will lead worship at the camp that Saturday. You know what 12th through the 14th means. Uh, so, uh, the reason I need to go get my phone is because there is a letter I would like to read for you from Mr. Blauert, our school chaplain at WLS. Uh, Dear members of First Evan and Water of Life, on Thursday, June 16th, the Lord of the Church saw to it that St. John Lutheran Church in Libertyville, Illinois, would extend a divine call to me to serve as principal and minister of outreach. I'm very humbled by this. Helen and I ask for your prayers that the Holy Spirit guide me in my deliberations to see clearly where I can best serve our Lord and Savior in his kingdom. If anyone would like to offer their input, it would be greatly appreciated. Your servant in Christ, Mark Blauert. And he is here today, so you can offer that input in person if you would like. And we also thank him for helping with communion. Uh, Lord's blessings on your day. I invite you to greet your brothers and sisters here at Water of Life. Thank you. 